Discovery Journal. A week after the meeting in Kiev, Yeltsin and Gorbachev invited the leaders of ten republics here to the Kremlin. Their task was to hand over power to the republics without the entire structure of society collapsing. After seven hours, they had buried the Soviet Union. And like the founding fathers, they had designed an entirely new system. During the coup, Gorbachev revised his position. He is a political realist and a wise man. He came to the conclusion that it would be unrealistic to preserve the Union today in its previous form. It would also be unrealistic to insist on a federation. To do so would mean to disregard the realignment of political forces and the changes that have occurred. So he took part in this meeting as a man who had realistically assessed the situation and changed his views. During the following days, Gorbachev persuaded and even intimidated the Congress of People's Deputies to accept the end of the old Soviet Union. The republics were to become sovereign states, free to run their own affairs. What was left of the Union, like the military and national security, would be run by a state council. It would include Gorbachev and the leaders of ten republics, like Boris Yeltsin and Leonid Kravchuk of the Ukraine. The running of the economy would be handled by a committee representing the republics. But will the mix of independence on the one hand and the remnants of a union on the other work? There are already areas of tension between the Ukraine and Russia. Since last year, there have been serious gas shortages in Ukrainian cities. Russia, suffering a fall in production, has reduced exports, including those to the Ukraine. Over the last two months, Kiev has only received 60% of the fuel it needs. This is because Russia cut back on oil supplies. The question of prices should be resolved because reciprocal sanctions between the republics are unacceptable. The Ukraine has also restricted food exports. This state farm just outside of Kiev usually sends 15% of its produce to Russia. But food exports are restricted. Ukrainian needs come first. Those tomatoes which are sold will be paid for not in rubles, but in goods. It's a reflection of the economic crisis that barter is often the only way of ensuring a supply of raw materials. I think this is a temporary measure because the value of goods in the Ukraine has dropped drastically and the Ukraine's population has to be provided for. This is a temporary measure. We got a slightly better harvest last year and we sent off fruit. In return, we received uh, timber, piping, and metal. Now that they are independent, the republics are likely to look to their own interests first. Farms like this may have to ignore contrasts drawn up under the old centralized system. So before reforms have been given a chance, there could be economic disintegration. Other industries view the forthcoming divorce between the Union and the Republics with concern. This is the Antonov testing site outside Kiev. Until recently, it came under the Ministry of Aviation in Moscow. Now it has been declared a Ukrainian enterprise. In this carving up of the Soviet Union's assets, many in Antonov worry how future projects will be financed. As far as the current financial potential of the Ukraine goes, I don't believe the Ukrainian government will be rich enough to finance all our projects in the near future. And, of course, it's not just the workers who feel uncertain. It's the entire staff, engineers and designers. They all feel uncertain. We'll just have to keep on working. The Antonov 225, the world's largest plane, sits on the tarmac, awaiting customers and spare parts. The Soviet aircraft industry has been one of the country's most successful sectors, but it has been indulged with large budgets. Now, an uncertain future awaits.
So the redesigning of the Union poses a whole series of new problems. Even with the best intentions, the potential for conflict between republics is considerable. There will be difficulties, but there's one way to avoid conflict, and that's if the enterprises are stocked with raw materials and everything they need for work. The workers don't care who owns it, Moscow, Kiev, or anybody else. The main thing for an enterprise is to get equipment and raw materials, everything it needs to function normally so that people can earn a wage and feel socially secure. That's the most important thing. No one doubts the potential for conflict between the new sovereign states and the risk of chaos. The revolution has dismantled the old structures. But what influence will its former communist administrators retain? Inside the Moscow City Council, the Commission on Anti-Constitutional Activities holds hearings. This commission, like several others, is investigating what actions people took during the coup. The investigators are less concerned with the main plotters, but more with the role played by administrators. It has the power to call witnesses and can recommend dismissal. A manager at a Moscow car plant is summoned. He's questioned about the case of a worker who went on strike in protest at the coup, but was subsequently fired. He had been absent for four weeks. Why did you decide on him then? The steam commission, staffing is our number one problem. The workers had discussed it. He should have realized. He works for a while, and then the same thing happens. It was a rather convenient time, wasn't it? This man came to work thinking he'd be a hero. Instead, he's been victimized. Most cases are difficult to untangle, and there's little evidence of action being taken against party officials. Outside of Moscow, too, in places like Ryazan, Party members, once held up as model citizens and workers, are under investigation. But this is a gentle revolution, with little passion for revenge. It is recognized that a purge of bureaucrats who also were party members would be dangerous. <laughs> 